Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 136 of Analyzing Evil, featuring our patron pick for July 2023, Marlo Stanfield, from The Wire. Marlo is the all-consuming and ever-present shadow of the last three seasons of The Wire, the young man without a heart and with no conscience, who terrorizes his contemporaries and nearly outsmarts them all to become undisputed lord of the streets he calls home. In this video, we're going to discuss every component of this barbaric kingpin, running through all aspects of the world that made him, his personality, and his crimes, to get a better understanding of how one man can become so dedicated to, and proud of the evil that's laid claim to his person, and the world he inhabits. But you know what might have helped soften Marlowe's hard exterior? A good night's sleep with a sleep mask from our sponsor for this video, Manta Sleep. Manta Sleep makes unparalleled sleep masks and sleep accessories. And in a world where many people are increasingly losing precious hours of sleep, their services are invaluable. For example, to put it eloquently, I often sleep like a steaming mound of canine refuse. My mind races, the slightest sound has me tossing and turning, and even a pinprick of light is enough to rouse me. The mask I received from Manta, the sound mask, has greatly helped me in all those areas. It's comfortable, offers complete and total blackout, and razor-thin Bluetooth headphones that block out all noise and help put my mind at ease with relaxing sounds. But that isn't the only mask Manta offers, and by using their sleep quiz, you can find out which of the options you're seeing on screen now are right for you. A good night's sleep is one of the most important things you need to live a happy and healthy life. And you can start getting one every night with Manta Sleep by clicking the link down in the description. And as an added bonus, you'll receive 10% off your order by using the code VIAL at checkout. Thank you, Manta Sleep, for sponsoring this video. Now, without further ado, let's begin. I won't bother ruminating on Marlo's backstory, as we aren't given one, and it's obvious where he originates from. What I'll do instead is speak upon the shared backstory Marlowe has with every gangster in Baltimore. In the employ of every gangster and drug runner in this city, we find people known as hoppers, and this profession is perhaps the most insidious position available to the young men and women who live in these forgotten and neglected neighborhoods. Hoppers are miners who guard the stash of the corner boys, acting as one of the many links in the chain that disperse the possibility of incrimination through the ranks. It doesn't take much guesswork to figure out just how horrible of a practice this is. Children who are barely of age to enter primary school are indoctrinated into a criminal lifestyle by friends or family members, drastically reducing the chance that they'll develop in a healthy way and perpetuating the cycle of crime, poverty, and strife in these low-income areas. Add in the neglect, abuse, and encouragement that these children suffer from their parents, who are typically also involved in this game in one way or another, and you have the perfect recipe for a deeply flawed world that would take years, if not decades of effort to mend. Hoppers become corner boys, corner boys become soldiers, and soldiers become kingpins, and on and on the cycle repeats as new boys and girls step up to fill the shoes of those who fell before them, or who ended up staring at a set of bars for the rest of their lives. This is exactly how Marlowe likely got his start, and though we don't know the particulars of just how this happened, it's guaranteed that his story followed the same path as the thousands of young men and women who came before and after him. Marlowe proves himself to be quite proficient at ensuring that fresh blood becomes interested in taking the exact same path he took, as we do see Marlowe scouting and enticing young boys to become members of his own organization, namely by providing them with gifts via his subordinate monk, warming them up to him with promises of big payouts should they show their allegiance to him. But we're given a more intimate look into the process when he takes an interest in Michael, correctly surmising that what's in himself that allows him to reign terror over West Baltimore is within Michael as well. And through training and education, Michael through Chris and Snoop ends up becoming one of his up-and-coming corner boys who might one day wear that same crown that Marlowe gave his all to obtain. This is essentially how Marlowe came to be who he is. But as I mentioned earlier, everything else about him is a mystery. Parents, relations, romantic interests, all are a mystery as far as Marlowe Stanfield is concerned. In fact, that's part of the legend of Marlowe Stanfield, the young boy with a scar across his cheek who appeared in a puff of smoke to challenge the Barksdale organization in West Baltimore, and succeeded, in a manner of speaking at least, as Avon Barksdale's second incarceration and Stringer Bell's death essentially handed this territory to him. Now why Marlowe became this legend has to do with something else that draws the children of these neighborhoods into this lifestyle, the gangster legends of their city, the young boys and OGs who wore the crown before Marlowe was even a thought. 
As he was running game on his chosen corner, young Marlowe looked out upon his would-be kingdom as he was regaled with the exploits of these larger-than-life gangsters and made it so his destiny would be to continue their legacy, the next young man seated on a throne that stands atop the mountain of lives that came before him. Now the stories of these legends didn't just give Marlowe a goal to achieve, they also greatly aided the formation of Marlowe's personality. Marlowe is by far the most stone-cold kingpin that we are exposed to in this series, and he has serious determination to match his demeanor. Nothing scares Marlowe Stanfield, and nothing is off-limits for him either. Marlowe wouldn't back down from a bull charging at him, nor would he flinch if he needed to drown a bag of puppies to ensure that his power develops to the point of an absolute. It just so happens that both of these metaphorical obstacles present themselves to Marlowe at different points in his career in very real ways, headstrong and confident to a fault. Marlowe stands tall as the organization of Avon Barksdale and Stringer Bell seek to stamp him out. And when any member of the other various gangs that comprise the New Day co-op try to challenge him, they're taken care of without a step taken backward, earning instead the ruthless efficiency of a man who treats murder as a simple chore that requires little to no thought. Civilians who are game adjacent, or caught in the crossfire, are no more safer than those in the game either. And Marlowe isn't above killing anyone for any reason, so long as it suits his purpose. That isn't to say that Marlowe is brutal to the point of mindless stupidity. Quite the contrary, in fact. He is exceptionally stubborn, but he's not so egotistical that he'll ignore prudent advice when it's given, as Prop Joe manages to educate him to some effect. And he often listens to the words of his number one and two, Chris and Snoop. A small amount of willingness to listen and learn that adds to his effectiveness as a strong leader who rules with an iron fist, but one who's willing to bend slightly should he need to. Marlowe is also cautious about how he runs his organization, and his soldiers seem to be a bit more regimented and disciplined than members of other organizations are. He refuses to talk in buildings. He has his underlings murder people in vacant homes and seal them up to not arouse suspicion. He makes sure his soldiers are as stalwart as he is. He keeps up on their marksmanship training, and we typically find him quite thoughtful about any move that he makes, showing that he has an aptitude for strategy and planning. And there are numerous times where Marlowe gets the upper hand on his opponents due to his superior tactics, like when he has Devon tailed out of suspicion and ends up one-upping Avon in his plot to have him killed, or when he has Chris entice Cheese to turn on Prop Joe so he can stake his claim on the product he receives from the Greeks. But intelligent or not, Marlowe often has a my way or the highway kind of attitude, which is especially prevalent after he eliminates Prop Joe and essentially disbands the co-op, letting all present know that he's taking over all aspects of the supply in Baltimore via his own people and Joe's replacement, Cheese, and his penchant for meeting any challenge, no matter how big or small, and overcoming it by sheer force of will and brutality is a hallmark of his character, and he does so to the point that most other gangsters in Baltimore are appalled at his behavior, and there's a good reason for that. Marlowe's cruelty and barbarity is the culmination of decades of murderous practices that were enacted by his predecessors, and now they have coalesced into the monster that we find in this series. What makes Marlowe all the more terrifying is how stoic and black-hearted he is. I could be wrong, but I don't think Marlowe displays a shred of empathy at any time in this story, and if he does, he only does so because it's necessary to advance his own interests. Marlowe is like a block of stone. He might crack a half-smile here and there, or offer a few laughs, but more often than not he's silent and domineering, and the few words he does speak are used only to advance his business in any sordid way that he deems necessary in that moment. What's interesting to note about Marlowe, though, is that he isn't really a sadist. He doesn't revel in the act of killing or harming others for his own pleasure. However, he is a megalomaniac, and one of the most harrowing scenes we're given in regard to this aspect of Marlowe is the scene where he and Chris arrive at Prop Joe's home to execute him. Here we find Marlowe calmly assuring Prop Joe that nothing can be done to help his predicament, and after Marlowe guides him through the motions leading to his doom, and the deed is done, Marlowe soaks in this moment, seemingly absorbing the necrotic energy emanating off of Prop Joe's body as it fills him with the power he once held, the passing of a king's might to another, as he comes one step closer to absolute power over what Marlowe believes to be his by right, the entire underbelly of the city of Baltimore, and all who reside amongst its seedy row houses. Speaking of Marlowe's pleasures, his interests outside of the game and the power that comes with it seem to be next to none. The only leisurely activity we see Marlowe taking is one trip to a nightclub, a short liaison with Devon, and gambling. When he was with Devon, he made love to her, 
for a lack of a better word, like an animal, only using her quickly and roughly to get his satisfaction, afterwards offering a nice, that worked for me, when she attempts to make small talk. Why Marlowe's only other activity is gambling is easy enough to divine, as his whole existence is focused on obtaining power and money through risky behavior. And what is the game, if not a more complicated form of gambling? Power and money are central to Marlowe's pursuits, but he's also intimately concerned with his reputation and his legacy. Marlowe often talks about his name being his name, the word on the streets that gives him his power. Just as Omar's name rings out down alleyways as he stalks through neighborhoods, it's Marlowe's name that strikes terror into almost every man working a corner in Baltimore. And just as Marlowe never backs down from a challenge to his power or his ambitions, he similarly stands his ground when anyone dares to speak ill of him in even the smallest way. We'll be covering this more later once we get to his crimes, but the best example we're given of just how important this is to Marlowe is when he learns of the challenges that Omar gave him when he was hunting him after Butchie's murder. Marlowe is infuriated when he learns that his subordinates withheld information from him regarding these challenges, and this moment is perhaps the one time we get to see Marlowe expressing a healthy dose of emotion, rage filling him as he declares that every corner of his kingdom should be told that he didn't know about the trash Omar talked, and that if he did, he would have taken care of Omar himself. This obsession with his reputation is Marlowe's greatest flaw, as he is relatively cautious and careful in the way that he conducts his horrendous business. But if this is how he reacts to being badmouthed, it's no wonder his lieutenants wanted to keep it secret from him, as rushing out to deal with anyone who might speak ill of him heightens his exposure to danger considerably. So money, power, reputation, and legacy. Those are the only things that concern Marlowe Stanfield, and while he certainly loves to earn both, the satisfaction he gets from holding them seem to bring him just as much joy as anything else, which is to say not very much at all. Marlowe is truly a beast, a creature focused solely on the thrill of the hunt, and just like a beast, he has little to no use for the laws of man, official or unsanctioned. During a conversation Bunny Colvin is having with Weebay, they talk about the old days, how the people running the corners in the game were a family, and they had a code. But now, in this new age, there is no code, only the will of the street. And that will is to kill or be killed, take or be taken from. And for anyone who dares to even breathe in your direction, no quarter should be given, as the men at the top will give you none should you try to take what's theirs. It's easy to see how things got so out of hand though, and it's because of the men and women who came before Marlowe. Though they also grew up in less than desirable circumstances, they were privileged enough to have lived in these areas when they weren't as corrupted by the activities of gangsters and addicts. And while the housing projects these people lived in were less than ideal, they weren't anywhere close to being as run down as they've become by the time this series begins. In any given neighborhood, you'd find some addicts and some thugs and perhaps your parents or other relations were in the game. But again, the conditions in these neighborhoods were nowhere near as close to the war zone-like conditions that we find in the West Baltimore that Marlowe now reigns over. Like many cities in the US, once the 1980s hit and new drugs began to flow into the streets, things started to become exponentially worse. And when the people of your community continually engage in criminal behavior that only worsens over time, conditions begin to deteriorate and the number of people who live in these neighborhoods that aren't addicts or involved in the game start to become less and less. And the ones who aren't are still forced to live in the conditions that were created by the malefactors in their communities. As we've already discussed, these places are poor environments for children to be raised in especially when you consider the outside forces working to bring them into their nefarious fold. So when Avon, Stringer, Weebay, and others talk about how things have changed and how brutal and horrendous their new competition has become, the only people they have to blame for their existence is themselves. And Marlowe is nothing more than a man whose primary education was all the worsening criminal activity in his area. So, Living in the sordid world that his predecessors created, the need to abide by any sort of code has been abandoned in favor of survival and advancement in this urban hellscape. And in order to do either, one must attempt to outdo the devil himself at his own game. And Marlowe's success in this arena is what gives him the edge. Now Marlowe and his crew engage in all your typical violent gangster crimes. There are numerous times where people under Marlowe's command beat people or murder them for the sake of the game and we've seen both drive-bys and executions from members of his organization. 
every murder committed by members of Marlowe's organization can be attributed to his influence, and when we take into account the actions of his right and left hand, Chris and Snoop, all the terrible things we see them do are but an extension of Marlowe's will, as well as his no-limits attitude towards violence. Now what separates Marlowe from, say, Avon Barksdale, is the lengths he'll go to to punish someone for even a minor infraction. Now, sometimes you'll find that a gangster will order the murder of another person for trash-talking them, depending on the severity of their accusations. But up until Marlowe's time, it was more often the case that someone earns themselves a beating or a few broken limbs if they step out of line. Marlowe is a different animal, as as we've already discussed, Marlowe is dead serious about his reputation, and anyone who insults so much as a hair on his body is liable to find themselves lying in chalk. Take, for example, the security guard that spies Marlowe lifting suckers from the store that he works at. He dares to get in Marlowe's face after Marlowe openly challenges him to do so. And when he proceeds to make a half-hearted attempt at browbeating Marlowe, Marlowe returns his jabs in what appears to be a dangerous game of chicken. But no one gets to play with Marlowe Stanfield and live to tell the tale. And shortly after this conversation, this unnamed man finds himself the victim of Marlowe's murderous will, taken out by Chris and Snoop for trying to do his job and being understandably fed up with a man who was undermining him right in front of his eyes. This man was a civilian, an innocent whose crime was talking out of turn. And because of this simple exchange that couldn't have lasted more than five minutes, he lost his life. A similar occurrence happens to a gangster named Junebug, who apparently spread rumors that Marlowe is a sucker. This is at least a bit more understandable than the murder of the security guard, as you can't have rival gangsters trash-talking you and let them get away with it. But rather than perhaps teaching him a lesson in one way or another, Marlowe prefers to set an example through murder. And a man whose crime against Marlowe was relatively innocuous earned a severe punishment for his misstep. Then of course you have the people who lose their lives simply off of suspicion. In truth, murdering anyone who you suspect even a little of being an informant might be a prudent action to take for a kingpin. And Marlowe isn't the first, nor is he the last gangster who would kill someone because of this. But in practice, it is horrific, especially when you consider you're immediately murdering someone without really verifying whether they quote-unquote deserve it or not. And Marlowe takes this action first with little Kevin, an adolescent, then Andre, and Bodie, and finally, he attempts to have the same done to Michael, another adolescent and stalwart member of his organization. However, ordering Michael to be taken care of served a dual purpose as he was already causing suspicion from other members of the organization, as he would often speak out of turn, a quality not welcomed by the Stanfield outfit. Now Marlowe isn't above seeking revenge when he feels the need to either, as we see when he goes to great lengths to draw Omar out of hiding by having Chris and Snoop torture Butchie, another notch in his belt of horrors. Similarly, it would appear that Marlowe isn't above murdering or ordering the murder of innocent people either, as prior to the murder of Butchie, we do see Chris murdering an innocent woman in order to frame Omar and get him arrested, an act which goes even further in establishing the fact that Marlowe essentially has no limits when it comes to his business. However, you have to keep in mind that every murder or barbarous act that Marlowe commits or orders to be committed is just a hair more brutal than his contemporaries. And while he is the latest worst offender in a long line of criminally barbaric men, his trigger-happy attitude and ruthlessness is definitely something that sets him a cut above his peers. That being said, just like Avon before him, he did have an out, and he could have potentially retired from his life of crime, receiving a promise of freedom from the Department of Justice, as long as he separated himself from the underworld. But in the end, we find Marlowe incapable of doing so, and the prospect of years in prison, should he indulge in his inner demons, is not enough to bring clarity to a mind that's firmly mired in the horrors of the world that he wishes to lord over. And even with a harbinger of that guarantee that's given to him via a cut on his arm when he runs off two corner boys in his final appearance, Marlowe still likely went back to operating as he always had, continuing his pursuit of the crown, even as it threatened to cave in his skull. And at this end, who was Marlowe Stanfield? He was a product of the street, a boy that was raised in conditions created by the villainous men who came before him, one who was educated by their crimes and the legend of their exploits. Marlowe ended up being perhaps the most ruthless kingpin that Baltimore had ever seen, but as I've already mentioned, he actually wasn't much worse than the men who came before him. Torture 
murder, extortion, theft, bribery. All these things occurred under the Barksdale regime, and though these crimes weren't committed as instantly or as ferociously when Marlowe held the reins, they were still a part of life before Marlowe emerged on the scene. With all that we've discussed about Marlowe so far, and this notion in mind, it's easy to see that Marlowe is essentially a combination of Stringer Bell and Avon Barksdale, one that has been amplified to the next level. Marlowe has all the bravado and drive of Avon Barksdale, and he has all the quiet confidence and intelligent mind of Stringer Bell. He's the worst and best parts of them packaged into one man. And just as they reigned over this hellscape with brutal efficiency, so does Marlowe during the time he's given to hold the crown that's so dear to him. Even so, even though Marlowe is the worst of the worst, he's a victim of circumstance, just like anyone else in his position. But the difference between Marlowe Stanfield and other gangsters is how he thrives on the evil that he sows, how his very soul is unsatisfied lest he give in to his greed, bloodlust, and megalomania. But again, who is to blame for Marlowe Stanfield? Yes, you can blame the men and women who came before him that succeeded in the same sordid business that he was engaged in. That's for certain. But you can also blame a mismanaged and corrupt government, one that places its priority on politics and self-enrichment. You can blame the police officers who treat the people they're supposed to serve and protect like animals or enemies rather than fellow citizens and members of their communities. Not to mention their command structure who would rather juke stats to keep up appearances than show the truth and get the help they need. You can blame an education system that's more concerned with test scores than the well-being of its students. And you can blame the world that all these things created that makes it so much easier to become a hopper or an addict than anything else. We also have to keep in mind how difficult it is for anyone in these areas to find any sort of upward mobility outside of what's readily available to them. In a conversation Duke has with Cuddy, Cuddy tries to tell him that there are other places in the world and that Duke doesn't have to learn to fight or tend a corner. He can be anything he wants to be if he so wishes. But then Duke asks, how do you get from here to the rest of the world? And Cuddy's only response is, I wish I knew. This is the reality for thousands of people living in horrid conditions. You can try to lift yourself up as best you can, and you very well should, with the methods available to you. But leaving all that you know, all your friends and family, and the people that you can rely on for parts unknown to try your chances there is a gamble at best. And many people find themselves stuck in a cycle that never ends, one where the best options they can see aren't very good options at all. This is the world of Marlowe Stanfield, a brutal and unforgiving one that created a brutal and unforgiving man. And unless some serious change is made by some serious people, it's a world that's unfortunately doomed to always spawn the next great evil to stock its streets. Thank you all for tuning into this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Marlowe? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you liked this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, to my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and subreddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.